So, and okay, let me see, got it. And, um, you know, one of the things uh, we, we uh, I want to emphasize here is, you know, there's this myth that Wi-Fi is, is, is not a, a technology good enough for certain use cases that require determinism in, in communications. And, and, and the answer is actually, it was true uh, back in the day with Wi-Fi 5, 4, use cases that Wi-Fi was trying to address did not have these such these requirements. And uh, the focus was, on, you know, supporting more users and, you know, increase the data rate. And that's what you can see, you know, if you see the features listed here, that's exactly what you can see here. That was the, the trend, right? Now with the introduction of Wi-Fi 6, we're moving more from an managed kind of network to a more managed network. And, um, and the way this was done basically was uh, enabling a trigger uh, OFDMA. Yeah. I'll provide a little bit of the uh, discussion about what trigger OFDMA means. Um, so, so what does uh, trigger OFDMA uh, mean? So typically, in Wi-Fi radios, uh, since you, you're operating in the in a licensed bands, uh, you need to listen before you talk. So, uh, so what happens is all the devices operating a particular band they're contending for access to the channel, and if there are many devices, as you can imagine, you know your your access to the channel is going to be delayed, and it's going to cause a degradation of your throughput and your latency. Uh, and we just see here on on the on the top is the traditional operation of you know old or dot eleven AC you know Wi-Fi five radios where uh, you you have a um, a set of stations. Let's put it this way: nine stations. They are contending for the channel. Once you have access to the channel, um, you're given for a certain duration of time, uh, certain bandwidth, say 20 megahertz, and then you start sending packets. Um, so that's the way it will work. And if you want to serve nine stations, you, you have to go serially uh, through the different stations. So now with the introduction of trigger-based OFDMA, there's a couple of things you can do. So one, you can actually stagger users. So instead of you know um, having uh, users to use the whole bandwidth, for transmission, you can actually share the bandwidth with the, uh, within different stations, club them together in a single packet. And in addition to that, um, you can trigger, you can control who says what uh, by the use of a uh, trigger transmission. So let's let's put, some, for instance, an example uh, that you have nine uh, stations um, that you that you want to serve, right? So the access point through the use of a trigger uh, trigger frame can tell these stations. Uh, Hey, you guys uh, need to send me data, coordinate these stations so they send at the same time and club the, the information that they're sending in a single packet. So by doing so, so you achieve two things. You're much more efficient, meaning you can reduce significantly the latency. Here is, a, you know, you're cutting in half and you add more control over the network. You, you're allowing the access point to tell people what they say and uh, not what they say, but when they say it. Um, so again, Wi-Fi 4, 5 now moving to 6 is giving you the tools to, to have more control over the network and uh, have more determinism. Now, in addition to this, if, uh, if, if, you, if you have a network where, uh, excuse me? Oh, if you have a network where all the devices can be managed, say all the devices are Wi-Fi 6, you know, can you actually uh, design a schedule that allows you to uh, have high reliability in addition to low latency or the deterministic latency. And this is one simulation we run here. Uh, in, uh, this particular example, we have 20 megahertz channel, a small 100 byte packets, 50 meter radius, and then we just drop the client randomly in that environment. And what we see here is depending on the uplink latency bound that you have, uh, you can achieve uh, a 99.99 a .99 packet delivery rate. 4, 9, 18, 28, 35, um, 45 uh, radius uh, with uh, 1, 1.5 2, 2.53 millisecond uh, uh, uplink latency bound. Uh, now, uh, packet delivery rate, you know, you have the definition uh, at the bottom there. So, what it's basically is telling us is, you know, with Wi Fi 6 today and the right conditions, you can actually achieve high reliability and low latency communications. And this is something that can be done today. So now what is interesting is, or you might ask, okay, well, this is in a managed network. So what will happen if, if you have a radius that are unmanaged? 
right? So why, what would happen if this environment, you have Wi-Fi 4, Wi-Fi 5, right? So I said, uh, you know, we're moving towards a more managed and we are providing the tools uh, to, to achieve there's that. A, there's a question, um, oh. Abhishek. Yeah. Oh, hi, Harry. I have yeah. one quick question. So yeah. most, most of the AR or XR applications, they are mostly uplink driven. But uh -huh. the, the mobile networks, the way they have been designed, they are more optimized towards downlink, which uh -huh. is really because they don't know what to expect for the uplink. So the optimization is mostly done for the downlink. So this Wi-Fi 6, has it been optimized? So is it like uh, asymmetrical, like like mobile network is asymmetrical. So how does it work here? Is it optimized for uplink? Well, you will always have the, the limitations in the uplink of the radio transmitter, right? That the client devices in the, in the access point, you're gonna have much more antennas there. You're gonna have this asymmetric link uh, always there. But what this is allow you to, to have is a much uh, better managed uh, um, um, uplink and downlink communications. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, uh, right. Some, but uh, but thank you very much for now. I will ask later. Bit more. Oh, okay, we can we can take it offline. Yeah, yeah Brighton me... has a question on chat. Brighton, you want to ask it yourself? Yeah, uh, and I actually had one other question also. What what's the units of capacity in this plot? So the units of capacity. No, the, so this plot here is uh what is represented is the packet delivery ratio. And what you, you have here is fraction of packets successfully delivered within the latency bound. So you are defining, for instance, in this uh, uh, bar here, your latency bound is one millisecond. And then what you want is the packets to arrive within this latency bound with a 99.999 PDR. And when you run the simulation, what we show is that you can support up to nine radios with this, um, with this constraint. And this uh, okay, so the y-axis is number of radios. Yes. So with okay. one millis obviously, as you relax the latency bound, you can support more and more radios. And and that means that basically all of those participating radios and all of the participating packets would get that same service of uh -huh. being able to expect that particular bound latency yeah. bound for ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the the packets. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Um, I, I have a quick question yeah. as well. Um, if I understand correctly, one of the reasons why wireless networks are not so reliable is fading and uh, you know the environment itself, right? So how does having the ability to trigger or or, or whatever Wi-Fi six gives? How does that mitigate okay. uh, those kind of problems? So this uh, this is a good question, and actually um, on a, on OFDMA, there's been a uh, on OFDMA and OFI 6, there's been additions to, to mitigate the effects of fading. Um, and, and maybe we can take it offline. But the trigger um, access uh, is more related to the interference that other radios can cause on, on your communications. So now we, we actually uh, can provide uh, some ideas on how we could mitigate fading in your network um, in two slides from, from now. Um, but, uh, but yes, the, the, the at the end of the day, what's what's gonna limit you is the um, MCS, the transmit power, all these parameters. And, and I agree with you that fading is an issue, but it's an issue that we can mitigate uh, significantly with the with the tools that we have today. Hey, so maybe, Javier, uh, th this is Dave. Can can I comment on that? Yeah. Sorry, I, I had I had to join late because I had trouble to, to get in. But uh, you know, so the the question about the fading, I just want to point out that when you trigger you also select, you have an option to actually assign a particular bandwidth to that radio within this, what we call the RU, right? Uh, uh, so so we can... Dave, Dave, you, um, we couldn't hear you. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I'm just saying, you know, when you trigger, you have a few parameters that you can adjust for that radio that can uh, uh, help mitigate some of the fading effects like the bandwidth you allocate the RU size you can give more bandwidth and also the MCS so you can add more redundancy yeah. so those two together they can you know adjust and that uh, and it all depends on your channel quality and then there will be a trade-off on latency as well right because the packet may get longer so those are all trade-offs that the scheduler 
can play with, right? So, so those are tools that can we can use, right? And, uh, and and in this case, the scheduler tries to optimize the latency. So we try to serve everyone with that latency and the the PDR that Javier showed. You know. And one thing I want to mention here, Dave, this uh, we're using the IEEE channel model E, which is uh, one, uh, the channel model that adds more uh, fading to right. the channel to the, to the yeah. Okay. So we. All right, let's move because we. I would yeah, like to cover everything. It, yeah, thank you. Yeah, but if, if uh, and uh, also, uh, Professor, if there are questions, let me know uh, because I don't see the, yeah, the sure. chat. Yeah. All right, let's move. And then one of the things I wanted to mention here, yes, you know, continue moving. Which is the question was posed: there's, Okay, you have trigger access. The simulation results are nice, but what if you have Wi-Fi four five radios or, or in, these are radios you cannot manage? And I think that the answer the industry is coming with is, well, we're opening now six gigahertz band. And there are many benefits of, of, of doing so. First of all, obviously, all of a sudden you get 1200, you know, additional megahertz you can play with. Uh, and you can see they are doubling the number of 20 megahertz channel. And now you have this 160 megahertz channel, you have up to seven. But most interestingly is that, you know, no legacy devices can operate in this band. In other words, you can only have Wi-Fi 6 and beyond in this radio. And if you have only Wi-Fi 6 and beyond in this radio, it means that all the radios operating in this band can be managed by an access point. Again, moving towards the goal of more determinism. So this is a, you know, a summary of what you can do today because Wi-Fi 6, 6 e radios are already in the market. But what is coming? So as you can imagine, I typically a forum, there are many, many new features that are being discussed, but what I'm doing here is I'm just emphasizing the ones that I think are um, of interest for, for this um, audience. First of all, you, you know, Wi-Fi 7 radios will be able to use uh, six gigahertz band, but now with a um, much bigger bandwidth. So we're moving from 160 to 320. What it means is uh, basically the four to five times gain in the, data rate. So we're moving to, from 9.6 to 46.1. Uh, potentially, it all depends on the, you know, the channel conditions and the way you set up the radios. But overall, you're going to get this gain. So you have a, increase, a, a significant increase in the in throughput. Um, and uh, in addition to that, um, you have uh, also enabling um, MLO, which is basically the capability of uh, using multiple radios. Um, in a single uh, network interface uh, card. So now there are different flavors that are being discussed, but you, you can think of, you know, your NIC now is gonna be able to be connected um, simultaneously to the, I don't know, five gigahertz and six gigahertz band. And what that allows you to do is, I mean, you can think of many things that you could do with this capability, right? So if you want additional reliability, and this is answering maybe the question that was asked before about fading, Okay, well, maybe you don't experience as much fading in one band versus the other. Um, so that's the way you, you, you survive, uh, you know, fading. You can do, you know, packet duplication, send the packets over the two links. And then, uh, you know, you know that you have a much higher probability of the packet arriving uh, error-free. Now you could think of, uh, you know, how to, uh, for a given application, how to split the data streams across different bands, uh, depending on the stream requirements and the band conditions. Um, you know, if you want to maintain the latency at bay, uh, and, and what I mean with latency is more related to, you know, channel access, right? So, well, if you're trying to, to access parallel chan uh, channels in parallel, the chances are you're going to be successful earlier. So, as I mentioned before, new tools in your toolbox to make your, your wireless network deterministic. And this is a summary of what we've been talking about. There are other aspects about core capabilities and quality of service management, um, you know, network, you know, how can we do management and scheduling and so on. And then there's another new set of tools that are being explored, which is the wireless TSN. And this is gonna, this slide is gonna be a segue to, to, to the next block of this discussion, which is, you know, in addition to everything I've discussed so far, uh, there are, other things that are we're, we're kind of bringing from the TSN to wireless TSN that will, you know, further or further push us towards this goal of having deterministic Wi-Fi. So now, having said this, since this is the end of the first block, uh, you know, you guys have any any question?
All right, so let's uh, let's move to to WTSN. Now, before I talk to uh, before I talk about uh, WTSN, I would like to talk about TSN in general. TSN is an acronym from Time Sensitive Networking, and TSN has been around for a while, uh, ten plus years. This is TSN is basically a set of standards and protocol with the only goal of you know enabling deterministic data delivery with bounded latency. Um, Without loss of due to congestion of errors, and, and this is um, this 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 set of technologies were developed for the the, the industrial networks that you typically find in in factories and so on. Now the key challenge and, and the reason why it, TSN um, was uh, created was well there were multiple reasons. First one being the fact that you had to maintain two networks. You have your IT network, you have your OT network. Uh, IT network, just for information, general purpose. OT network was to, to support the communication between machines. Your you know PLCs and so on that you might have there. So this, this is costly. And the other reason was you know, typically OT networks would use their own proprietary uh, protocols. Um, those protocols serve their purpose, but uh, it limit the, the the users uh, limit the ecosystem, basically. So you could only connect the devices to that particular network that were compatible. So the whole idea here was, okay, let's merge IT and OT together. You have this cost reduction. And in addition, let's all speak the same language. So we, we, we have much better interconnectivity between networks. So that was the whole idea behind this uh, technology. And as I mentioned before, you know, this, this task group, um, uh, they, they have developed a bunch of different standards to serve this purpose. So what you have here at the bottom is a you know typical uh, TSN network. What uh, and the TSN network is typically formed by end devices and you can think talker and listener. And then you have an infrastructure, the TSN bridges that make sure that the packets um, you know go through the network and arrive uh, on time. Uh, so now the work we've been doing um, here in the labs is we we took this set of tools that have been developed. And we, we, we thought about how we could uh, bring those tools to, to the wireless domain to enable the same kind of capabilities that they already have. So what kind of use cases uh, were they exploring uh, or what kind of cases do they, do they serve and what kind of use cases are we, we, have we been exploring? And I, I, so the, the, the poster child for, for this TSN is the you know, isochronous industrial control, where you have a compute element that does the control, and you have a sensing and actuation uh, parts. You can think of a robot arm and then a camera. And then what you do is you, you send something with the camera. You send this information to the control. And then the control uses this information to actuate the, the robot. So now uh, this uh, kind of applications are typically characterized by isochronous data flows um, with short packets. And what I mean with isochronous is, you know, you, know, you can define the stream by just providing the packet size and its periodicity. But uh, when you look at the requirements for these kind of applications, uh, you know, latency um, are typically low and uh, highly deterministic. So you, you, the PDR number I was showing before, it's pretty high. Um, so this is one of the first things we start exploring uh, internally, and this basically make these uh, lines here wireless. But there are other things we also looked at as part of our research. Uh, one of the things we we're looking at is, okay, can we do wireless time synchronization to synchronize these cameras and create, you know, a 3D uh, accurate 3D models of, uh, of something we're capturing here? And for that, you, you know, you, you want to do the stitching of the video frames, you need to have this high accurate time synchronization. But I think what's interesting or what is more interesting for us, and this kind of teasing the, the, the last part of the talk we're gonna have later, is uh, some uh, similar, similarities we saw between the industrial synchronous control and, uh, and extended reality. In a way, if you, if you think, um, you can think of this as a, as a control loop when uh, you have this, um, when you offload some of the, so say the rendering to the, to, um, to a desktop, you could have the sensing phase where the HMD is, is basically figuring out your post, sending that post to the computer, and then computing a computer actuating the HMD by sending uh, a frame to the user based on the information received in the sensing phase. 
Now this is where the similarities end because you know, like here, you have a human in the mix that might that might uh, that might uh, change the the stream, um, you know, behavior over time. Um, but again, this is a little bit of a, you know the history of, of the use cases we're looking at. And now, uh, once I, I talk about the use, different use cases, what are, what are the set of uh, technologies that um, we have been working on in the lab? Um, and on what, uh, how do they uh, move us towards this goal of deterministic wireless communications? So today I'll be talking about uh, dot one AS over dot 11 and uh, dot one QVV. Um, so first one is uh, accurate time synchronization um, over wireless. And the second one is uh, time aware scheduling. Um, so let's first uh, focus on the left hand side of the figure. And what we have here is a typical industrial network where you have the different entities. You have COC, uh, the, the CNC. And what we have here is, is basically the CNC entity is collecting, um, collecting um, the requirements of each of the data streams that are going to flow through the network. So as I mentioned before, packet size and uh, periodicity and so on. And then uh, uh, the CUC shares this information with the CNC and the CNC uh, configures the network to, to guarantee that the packets are delivered on time. So I will provide more details about what the CNC does once I move to the right hand side of the figure. But for now, um, minimum requirement that you have in the network to be able to, to provide this degree of determinism is to have accurate time synchronization. And that's what dot one AS provides. It's a protocol uh, that allows each of the elements of the network to, um, to basically follow a, a grand leader clock. So you're gonna have, we're naming it here grandmaster, but basically this grandmaster is gonna be in charge of providing timing across the network. And then dot one AS is gonna make sure uh, that each device is going to be as, as close as possible to, to their clocks is going to be as close as possible to the grandmaster. So now our contribution here is to extend this Edo, uh, Edo 1 as uh, to extend it to, to wireless domain. Uh, now, um, going back to the topic about the CNC role, um, the set, central network controller, the role, as I said, is to, to configure the network properly so you meet the, your latency requirements, right? Now, how does it achieve this? Well, the CNC takes, as I mentioned before, all the stream requirements, and then it comes up with the schedule. So what it does is uh, comes up with the schedule and this distribute the schedule across the whole network. And what this schedule is, is, is basically, um, you can think of it as um, as um, a gate control list where at each device you have a set of queues. And what you do is for a particular stream, you open the queues um, and you close the rest of the queues just to make sure that that packet, once it comes, can be served without any uh, collision with other packets. And that's what um, QVV here on the right hand side is doing. As you can see, you have the access points, station one and two, three, uh, uh, one and two. And when a packet arrives, uh, you know, you close all the gates everywhere else. So no one is trying to access this medium, only the access point at this particular time. And then you, you send the packet uh, and they say, and then you can you know, guarantee that the packet arrives. So uh, I'm gonna stop here, but maybe it's a lot of information. Maybe you guys have some questions about this. Um, I don't know if uh, there are any questions yeah. so far. Yeah. Just one question. I mean, how do you handle like when you have like traffic burst, you know, like uh, it so happens something. So, so when you have a managed network, that's exactly what you want to do. So when you you have a, so you're, first of all, you you need to define which are the, the, the traffic flows that are critical and you have to provide the specifications. Like just to give you an example of you, if your post is sent every two milliseconds and, and you know that your post is gonna be hundred bytes. Uh, well, you can guarantee that the, that post arrives every two milliseconds by providing a schedule um, that opens um, a particular gate, for instance, in the access point or in the station every two milliseconds and you block the rest of the traffic. So if you have a burst of traffic coming from a different source, you block it. You just make sure that the, the, the gate for that particular traffic only is open 
every two milliseconds. And that's how you 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 would deal with that congestion. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So Javier, I have a, a sort of more naive kind of question about yeah. the architecture of this thing. So so this CNC, the scheduler is sitting where at the access point? What is so this the CNC distributes the schedule. So basically you have one schedule for this guy, one schedule for this guy, one schedule for this guy, one schedule for this guy. So now the where time synchronization is so important is because if you if the clock of these devices drift too much, the mm -hmm. schedule is gonna overlap and you're gonna have packet collisions. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one comment, uh, Javier. Uh, maybe yeah. the question is about you know in the implementation, right? So where is this CNC? So you know one way or one place where it's located is the wireless controller. I say in your enterprise, there is usually a, a device or you know in the server, an application that is configuring the network. So that's one place for this, you know, for, you know the the, the local network uh, controller. Okay. That, that's one location for it. One other question about the deployment context. So would this be uh, deployed in like a standard Ethernet network with these extensions or an IP based network? Or you know, what are the assumptions about uh, or, or standards about how this gets deployed in the context of more common networking technology? So I think uh, the first thing you have to guarantee is that these devices are TSN. Incompatible, so you can propagate uh, time uh, properly across the, the network. So that I think that's the the most uh, important thing to consider here, and that also includes the access point and the uh, stations. And that's where, you know, we've been working with uh, um, industry partners, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute to enable these capabilities there. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah, so the key here also important to highlight is it's all based on standard Ethernet and standard Wi-Fi. You know, it's not a new Wi-Fi spec or new, no new Ethernet spec, but, you know, the devices do need to add this additional layer of capabilities. That's a TSN layer, you know. And the idea is like the IT, and that's the, the, in the industrial domain, right? We are talking about integration of IT and OT. So the, the, the assumption here is that there will be a, a managed network, so in your enterprise to for, for, for deploying this, you know. All right, so let's- And then uh, uh, yeah. what happens when you have a device that's not compatible, that's not obeying the schedule? So I, I think this is, uh, uh, one of the assumptions we're making is it's, it's, it's uh, a managed network. Uh, okay, we, so, okay. yeah, yeah, we're making that, but, uh, as you will see, this is one of the challenges, uh, especially when you look at maybe gaming or, or a scenario like um, uh, not enterprise scenario, but rather uh, home scenarios. But we are also developing tools to mitigate the issues that might arise uh, because you, your devices do not adhere to, to a particular schedule. Yeah. All right, so let's keep moving. And uh, I think uh, this uh, next couple of slides is a little bit more about uh, the capabilities that we've built in, in, in here in the lab. Um, uh, what you have here is the uh, performance we're obtaining today uh, with respect to time synchronization accuracy. Um, uh, and just uh, for, for, you know, just a little bit informative here on the left-hand side, you see Time measurement protocol, how it works. You basically have a set of packet exchanges. Um, you collect timestamps and uh, T1, T2, T3, T4. And by using those timestamps, you can figure out uh, you know, link delay, neighborhood rate ratio. And based on that information, you can adjust the clock. Um, so the accuracy we're achieving today, uh, in a nutshell, is a single, single digit a microsecond. It might not um, sound uh, highly accurate, especially if you're going compared to wire domain, but when you start looking at the literature, we're maybe order of magnitude better than uh, whatever you can find uh, today out there. So, you know, single single digit microsecond is, it's pretty low for, for wireless time synchronization. And um, on the next uh, slide here, what we see is the effect of having QBB uh, enabled in your, in your network. 
And uh, for instance, this particular example, we have this requirement of uh, 10 millisecond latency bound. And what we did is we put together a talker, listener, kind of the, the, the network that we'd have before oversimplified network. You have the talker connected to the access point, access point sending data to the client, and then the client forwarding that data to the listener. Both and the, the access point, for instance, we're showing an schedule, QBB schedule example of the access point. And this should maybe shed more light on one of the questions we had before. So you have your TSN queue here and your best effort queue where you might have like this burst of data coming in, right? And what you're gonna have here is, you know, the, the, the here at the bottom, you can clearly see the, the stream requirements. So what you have is uh, packets every coming every 50 milliseconds and you want to, to meet this 10 millisecond latency. Uh, and what you do is you you have you have these two gates. One gate control the TSN queue, and the other gate controls the best for queue. So what you do at the beginning of your cycle time, you open the TSN queue, then you serve that packet, and after that you close it, and then you open the best for queue. And by doing so, you are isolating the TSN traffic from the best for traffic, regardless of what happens here. Now you have this other what we call guard band. And the reason why this is here is, uh, okay, what happens if you, if this best effort traffic gains access to the channel at the end of this, um, you know, at the end of this um, time period, right? Uh, you're gonna continue sending data. And then, uh, and then if you don't have this card band, what's gonna happen is you're gonna end up overlapping with this transmission. So what we do is we, we figured out the, the maximum time you can be sending data after you gain access to the channel. And we use that time to define the guard band. That's, that's the reason why you have this thing here. And uh, here on the right-hand side, what we see is the latency uh, histogram with uh, no QBB and with QBB. And I think results are self-explanatory. Right? So when you, when you have QBB, you can do uh, the traffic shaping and guarantee that you're you know, below the 10 millisecond where you don't, um, you might have uh, issues of best for accessing the channel and not uh, and allowing the TSN traffic to arrive on, uh, to access the channel and thus uh, uh, on time and thus uh, meet the latency requirement. Um, two questions. So if the citation is fake, they can be changed on this time. Excuse me, I, 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 cannot, I cannot hear you very well. It uh, sounds distorted. Okay. Uh, can you hear me better now? Uh, le uh, let's see if I can understand. Uh, so my question is, can you, uh, is the cycle time fixed or does it yes. vary depending on, okay. The, the cycle time is um, is, an, is something you need to provide beforehand. So if you know your application, you, so, so for instance, your application is um, formed by say, I don't know, 10 different data streams, right? So you might have a collection of data streams that are asynchronous and data streams that are not. So what uh, you would do basically is take the asynchronous data streams, characterize them. So asynchronous means you, you will have a fixed packet size and um, and you know periodicity, and then you provide this information to COC. The COC takes it to the CNC, and the CNC comes up with a schedule for all the streams. And once you do that, that's kind of set in stone. You kick, uh, you you start the the application, and then those uh, asynchronous streams should be served uh, with whatever requirements you you ask the, the CNC to provide. Now the, the rest of the data streams can be actually managed here in the best effort queue. And there, there are things that you can do with respect to packet tagging to prioritize and to prioritize um, those streams. So what if the requirements change on the go? Do you like recalculate the schedule? Uh, in the industrial domain, that is, that is not the case. And the industrial domain, that, that uh, never happens. Um, this is not something we have explored so far. We are making the assumption that uh, they are not going to change over time. And these are one of the things that we, we would like to explore as part of this uh, collaboration we have with the Elixir. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask a similar question, or at least I couldn't fully understand the question, uh, hear the question. But yeah. um, so, how long does it take to come up with a new schedule? Um, that the is a. That is, it depends on the size of your network. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a pretty large network and you have to support hundreds of uh, data streams, it's a fairly complex problem to solve. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, if your network is small, it's, it's, it's not, you know, the time it takes for coming up with the schedule is not that uh, significant. 
Can you but, uh, put some numbers to this? I can maybe. Yes, yes, I can forward you some papers on this. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So let me take a note of this. Yes. Yeah. I had a question that was um, somewhat related. So I'm assuming that devices have to like resynchronize their clocks with the grandmaster every so often. Yes. Like, how often would that happen and like what would the overhead be like? Okay, so we actually had this question uh, in a different call. Um, so right now, the way our radios are uh, set up is about uh, 100, 125 milliseconds, but the, over uh, the, the overhead is minimal. And another thing I want to mention is this is a configurable parameter. So if you see that you're, you're, you're for instance, fading, prosthetics in your channel are, I mean, it's basically flat fading channel, let's put it that way. You might not need to, um, your estimate uh, or your clocks are not drifting that much. You might not have to, to do it every 125 milliseconds. It might be overkill. But regardless, 125 milliseconds, you get the single digit uh, microsecond accuracy and the overhead is not that significant. Gotcha. And then I also, um, I, I have like some scenario in my head and I'm wondering if like this is possible in the network. Um, so say like you have some device that's part of the like TSN queue, uh -huh. um, but the device itself is like slowed down somehow. And uh -huh. that device sends out data that's like not in line with the schedule. Is that possible? Um, and like, if it is, what would happen? I think it, that is, that, that could be possible, but then um, that would basically mean that you're violating the the kind of agreement that you had with the COC and the CNC. And what will happen is you you, you will, the network won't, ser won't service you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, I think the next step of our collaboration is, is probably to do a joint optimization between the device compute side and what the CNC is preparing for its schedule. Yeah. Uh, but that's later, yeah. All right, so let's see. I want to have some discussion about XR. Let's try to, to go through this quickly. Now, this uh, is actually, hold on. Let me just pause this guy here. Let me, I'll try to go quickly through this. Um, so this is actually a demo we put together using the tools that I just presented before. What we have here is uh, kind of like a virtualized PLC. We're taking the, the control of the robot arm and we're bringing it to the, to the, to the server. Uh, and what we're doing is uh, uh, we're making the whole thing wireless. So the actuation commands to the robot and the feedback from the robot, they're all sent uh, wirelessly in addition to the gripper commands. But the gripper, gripper commands are kind of like best effort you can think of it, it's the smaller commands. I think what's interesting here is the robot control loop uh, requirements uh, and the uplink and the downlink in both, you, you, you see about 400 byte packets um, you're being sent every two milliseconds. So now if you if you don't meet those requirements, uh, this demo gets pretty ugly. I mean, the, because we're basically we're sending joint speeds, angular speeds, that's what we're sending for each of the, I think six joints that this arm has. So if you, if you don't send the packets on time, you start seeing jerky movement of the, of the arm. And, and this is a collaboration with the robotics guys that we have here. And we're actually using the arm that I have here in the back. And the reason why we are using this demo is if you don't have smooth control. You cannot pick up one euro coin and insert it in a slot. It's just not possible. It would just basically drop. Uh, but now let's look at the wireless part, right? And what we're showing here is the histogram of the, the measure cycle time. What does it mean? You know, as I mentioned before, you're sending packets every two milliseconds. So what I'm capturing here is the distance between consecutive packets and I'm plotting the histogram. And what you would expect to see is this histogram to have a peak at the two millisecond uh, mark. So um, what you have now is no background traffic or, uh, okay, now you have the best effort traffic and the QBB on. So you have background traffic and you have the control traffic happening. And as you can see here, your mean is in two milliseconds, you have a little standard deviation equal to one, but overall you're, you're achieving the goal of, you know, making sure that the packets arrive on time. Uh, sorry about that. So now uh, I think the next part, let me see. All right, so what we do is we take the QBB off and what you see clearly is the histogram, you know, shape is just, just 
destroyed. Basically, you're spreading the cycle measure cycle time across the x-axis, which means that you are not being able to preserve the determinism in your communications you want. And that was reflected here in the in the matrices that we're collecting. The cycle time is what, five milliseconds with a huge standard deviation. And now what you see here is the moment you re-enable the stack, well, you 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 go back to the, the two millisecond mark that you, you're expecting to see. So that's one demo. And then the other the other demo, I, I, this is a brief mention about ecosystem. Uh, so one of the things we've been doing uh, as part of our work is to engage with other partners in the industry to enable these capabilities. And we've been working with Keysight and Cisco uh, to bring up uh, you know, dot one AS and, and QBB in their uh, product uh, offering. And we have a demo, uh, we have shown a demo in MWC 22. This particular demo, uh, um, we have a time critical string that was the requirement was about one millisecond. And this is what you see here, about 1.2 millisecond uh, latency was achieved. The whole idea here, you have this e-stop button that creates a heartbeat. It's, it's a packet that's sent every millisecond. When you push this button, the heartbeat stops and then whatever task you are, you're implementing the factory stops. But uh, you, if you want more, more information about this demo, you can just click the, the link here. So now, uh, towards the discussion we want to have. Um, so, so one of the things that um, our work, group was doing is, okay, well, we have this set of technologies that are proven to be quite useful for, for industrial, you know, new industrial use cases, so virtualizing certain um, functions. Um, so can we use this, um, can we use this, uh, all these tools in a different um, domain or in different use cases? And that's when we started doing the, the kind of like a, like a review of different use cases. And we, we looked at XR as a potential place where wireless could, could have an important role. And at, at the first thing we did is, so we, we, we bought, but you know, uh, a HoloLens, so we started playing with it. And, uh, and then we also saw the literature. I mean, it, it, so we all know that uh, as marvelous as the HoloLens is, uh, it has uh, limitations and it's all because of form factor. And um, so, um, so basically um, you can get this great experience, but uh, for instance, the 3D models that you can render locally might not be as good as expected for certain use cases. Um, so in addition, you, you, you have the, the, the form factor is that's another thing that I, the industry is working on, just make it more lightweight and, and user-friendly, let's put it that way. And, and one of the ways to, to achieve this uh, in a much shorter time is maybe to take some of the modules that are part of the HMD and upload them into to a different uh, compute device. Here I'm using a gaming laptop. We know that uh, the guys from Meta are playing with this with our link. Um, so just to give you an example, that the whole idea is to move from from what we have on the left to much more accurate and rich, uh, you know, you know. Uh, XR experience. Now, uh, you know, getting to this point requires wireless communications uh, that today are not available in the market. But as you can see, the tools are being developed to, to get to the point where we, we can successfully use, uh, for instance, Wi-Fi to, to achieve this goal. Now, what are the use cases that we're interested in? Well, uh, we, we, we looked at the um, um, different use cases. One will be kind of enterprise scenario, where you know people have these XR glasses and they, they connect to the infrastructure, and they offload certain tasks to to the edge. Think of, think of it as servers that you might have here on campus, uh, and, and there's where you do, for, for instance, the, the rendering. And then the other use case we we have in mind is uh, peer to peer connection, say with a with your gaming lab, right? And, and so that would be another way where you maybe upload certain modules there, rendering and so on. But overall, um, this is where, where we add today in terms of you know uh, WTSN and the initial exploration we have done. Uh, but uh, once we got to this point, it was when we we, we learned about the, the existence of uh, Elixir, and I think that's where where our discussions started. And uh, we kind of gave the similar pitch to the Elixir guys. We, we talk about what we are interested in. And I think they, they, they are also, and maybe Sarita can comment on this, um, at the point where they are starting to look at this uh, topic, how to take some of these modules out of the 
HMD and, and see in, in the process how the quality of experience is, uh, is affected. Um, and we, we've been talks. Uh, so, so for instance, this could be an example of uh, we could do. So uh, today we, we have, um, uh, we, we, we can provide the soft access, um, the soft AP and station uh, software stacks to provide dot one AS uh, over dot 11 and QVV. And we can integrate WTSN in the Elixir uh, testbed and we could offload just to give an example, the VIO. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other things that obviously we could explore floating, but uh, as a start, then it could be, it could be this. So I, I don't know, Sarita, if you wanna uh, comment? Yeah. yeah, 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 no, exactly right. Um, so yeah, so we will very soon be uh, releasing a version of um, um, a plugin for Elixir where you can do offloading um, but um, uh, you know that's just on 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 a generic network with no fancy stuff. Um, and now we are starting to work with uh, with Javier's group to so that we can bring in some of this technology and explore the impact of uh, of more deterministic um, uh, you know access guarantees. And I think that's going to be really really interesting. And uh, again, you know the purpose of these meetings is to get people, the community excited about this type of research and start to contribute back to Elixir um, in, in various ways. Um, so if anybody here is interested in, in um, offloading as well as peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer connections, multi-party um, applications, et cetera, uh, let us know and we can start a working group. I think there's a lot of things to be done here. Uh, these are just starting points um, for this, you know, very exciting uh, thing, yeah. And uh, at this point, uh, I think um, uh, Intel's um, IP is not, it's, it's, Javier, you should speak to that. I think if yeah. others are interested. Um, yeah, so we actually had a brief discussion about this. So uh, the, the stack is not uh, open source uh, yet, but uh, there are ways we can give you access to the stack if you, you just have to talk to us and we, uh, we can arrange the same kind of, uh, thing we're doing with Elixir. So it, if someone is in the audience is interested in testing WTSN, you just reach out and, and we'll figure out how, how you yeah. can get it. Yeah. And we could do this work as part of the consortium. So there's only, you know, uh, figure out the legalese to do it yeah. that way. Uh, yeah. So that there's just, you know, one point of uh, negotiation. And uh, uh, if there are people interested, contact us and we will, we can work yeah. together on this. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, so I think this kind of ends my presentation. I have some concluding remarks. Uh, it's basically what I mentioned before, uh, which is, uh, you know, the myth of, you know, Wi-Fi is not good enough. Well, I think it's, it's, it's becoming old. I think with all the new tools that are available today and the tools that are coming, um, we, we see a future where we have um, deterministic Wi-Fi that can be used in applications such as, you know, XR. And on our side, we can say that, you know, the tools that uh, that we have developed here in the lab, and we are collaborating with uh, industry partners, they can offer single digit and microsecond accuracy. Um, and with deterministic latency and deterministic latency comes from the fact that you have QBB enabled. And in terms of, uh, of XR experiences, we think that uh, we can leverage uh, the tools that I mentioned and this presentation to improve the overall quality of experience when you offload certain uh, modules, um, HMD modules to the client edge or, or cloud. From our side, from our perspective, we, we, if we really want to achieve this goal, we have to fully understand the XR application requirements and most importantly, it's the behavior of the application and the, the streams of the application because that's a fundamental piece for us to, to configure the TSN network, but most importantly, to identify gaps and uh, influence the, the industry to, to cover those gaps in, with uh, changes, for instance, in the, in the standards. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to, to wrap up, say that, uh, you know, our, our most immediate, immediate goal is to work with Elixir guys in the integration of WTSN and, and the testbed. And, um, and start evaluating how this technology could be leveraged to, yeah. to, to offload 
um, tasks uh, to other devices. So, so with this, I, I finished the talk and uh, yeah. yeah, you guys have any other questions? We still have uh, three minutes. <laughs> Yeah, great. No, thanks, Javier. Uh, that was great. Um, so there is one question. Uh, William, you want to ask it? Yeah. So um, I, I'm curious how, many, how much throughput can this uh, WTSN can support to guarantee the packet latency, such as like less than five milliseconds? Well, you it all know? depends on the bandwidth, right? Yeah. Do you know like what is um, the average throughput that you can achieve? Because like in your... Um, uh, robot uh, simulations it's around like 400 bytes per two milliseconds that's roughly around like probably two mbps kind of yeah. you kind of calculate it in the seconds can you actually get like for example 20 mbps uh, what what should you do in order to get that level but uh, at the end of the day it depends on the the so you're gonna have it's a multi multi-dimensional problem right so it's gonna depend on the, uh first what is your reliability requirement? And okay. second, what is your packet size? And third, what is your bandwidth? And you have to play with these three factors to see if that particular stream can be scheduled properly or not. Because if you don't have enough bandwidth to just to serve the packet without any schedule, then obviously no. But I think that what is encouraging is the fact that if you go to six gigahertz, you're gonna have three 20 megahertz um, tops available to you which means that the maximum throughput that you could uh, potentially get uh, with QV support could be pretty high. I see. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's all an exercise of, you know, okay, what is the bandwidth that we, we have available, packet size, and uh, the latency requirement. Because, uh, you know, latency requirement is another issue. If your channel is not good, what's going to happen is you're going to have to go through retries. And going through retries will cost the latency to, to go up, which is something you don't want. So what you're gonna do um, to solve that is maybe reduce the modulation scheme that you have. So you make sure that in one shot, you, the packet is uh, right sometime. So again, it's a, it's not a trivial answer. Hey, <laughs> ha have here, uh, yeah. ju just one quick addition. You know, I, I, I wanna make sure it's, it's clear, like, uh, you know, the examples given there in the simulation is very specific, right? To a 20 megahertz channel. And that two megabit per second is actually the application throughput. You know, the these radios are standard Wi-Fi radios. You know, operating in five gigahertz or six now, right? So the throughput can be you know up to a few gigabits per second actually. So the, it, this is not limiting the throughput. You know, well, yeah. I mean, it's more scheduling on top of that. But uh, you know, I just want to be clear. Like we are not. Yeah. Uh, this is not a radio that has limitation, you know, compared to the standard yeah. Wi-Fi. You know, you can use the full throughput of the the radio, depend on your how much bandwidth you use, like 80 megahertz or 160, right? In 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 some cases, and even more, you know, in Wi-Fi seven. I see, but will there actually be any effect on the uh, latency guarantee that you? One yeah, and the higher the throughput, then the shorter the latency you can guarantee, right? And then yeah. the, the other part is the cycle. Okay, how many devices you have on the network? That has a, a, an impact as well, right? So I think that's what the figure was showing, you know. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, great. Thank you. I think that'll be one part of our study as well. Exactly. Yeah, very cool. Um, let's see. Um, Haitam, are you still there? Do you want to say a few words quickly about what you're doing. I don't know if I can miss. Uh, uh, I think he just dropped out. Yeah, just dropped out, yeah. just dropped out. I was, yeah, he's Haitam and Brighton are networking researchers here and they are also looking at some technologies to, to use XR. And so um, that's that would just have been a nice connection um, to, to try out, you know, several things. They're also, the Hytham's group is also looking at um, putting some of their work on Elixir, uh, but it's, it's, a different, it's a different situation. They're looking at millimeter wave, um, but still hopefully we can leverage some learnings from, from both projects. Sounds good. So uh, Sarita, uh, yeah. um, do you guys have any place to place to put the deck or how do Yes, we... absolutely. Yeah, please send it to um, just, you know, just send it, send it to me. That's fine. Okay. Um, that's good. And uh, we'll put it up. We'll put up the recording also. I assume that's all right with you. Um, Sounds good. 
Oh, thank you so much. And again, yep. uh, from the audience, if anyone's interested, uh, you know, non elixir folks, please, uh, and non inter folks, please let us know. Uh, as you know, we are pretty open to collaborations. And uh, next uh, next week, we will have, as I said at the beginning, a group from Berkeley. Uh, this will be more focused on how to do architectural simulation in the context of such large systems. They'll talk about their work they've done in the context of robotics, and they are interested in moving. Uh, those types of technologies for, for Elixir. So um, look forward to seeing many of you there. Thank you again, Javier. Thank you. Have a nice one. You too. Bye. Sure. Can I ask you one question? Yeah, sure. So uh, actually, in, during the very first meeting, I believe there was one presentation of Arena system from yeah. the current. Yeah. So uh, our group, at the University of Helsinki, they are more focused on the edge computing guy. So I recommended Arena, but uh, so they have tried to deploy it at their end, but they're getting a lot of errors actually based on their instructions. So I wonder who, who, who should I contact like to get a help? Uh, well, just send an email to Anthony. He's pretty responsive. If he doesn't respond, let me know and I can nudge him. Okay, great. Because we were planning here, so like at the old, we focus more on like from the Alexa side and the Helsinki group focus more on the arena side, more like okay. network side. Okay. Okay, I will let you know. Yeah. If, yeah. And thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right, folks. <laughs>